The Empire has a few rough years after Endor, but with proper management and Empire at War expanded Thrawn's revenge, you can take them from the brink of defeat to the edge of victory and beyond. So whether you've been struggling to get by as the galaxy's failing fascists, you just aren't sure if you've found all the units, or you have more dishes that needed to be done and a 20 minute video seemed like it'd cover it, this faction guide will hopefully help you out. If you haven't seen the beginner's guide to the mod as a whole, that may be worth checking out as well. Since the Empire's roster shifts as you go through the eras, we'll be starting with the first era regime, Sate Pestages, and then we'll talk about each era change as we go. The Empire is the faction which determines which era the game is in for everyone, so they have a lot of power in determining what's happening. Eras change in a few different ways. Either the leader dies, or 60 in-game weeks pass, which can come with some additional negative consequences outlined in the Mission Holocron, or the Imperial player voluntarily chooses to progress to the next one, by the political options menu, avoiding some of the negative consequences but ending the current regime early. Saint Pestage's era also ends if Coruscant falls. It's important to keep in mind though that while eras and tech levels share some attributes, they're not the same thing. Don't just rush into getting your leader killed because you want the number higher, that's a bad idea. You get and lose different things by progressing, but so do your enemies, so try to think about what you get from progression and when you want to get it. The Empire, as one of the two primary factions, has a pretty broad ability to fill different roles in their rosters. They're not as specialized as the other Imperial Warlords, but they still do have different compositions from the Rebels, for example. Your capital ships are pretty versatile, with additional support coming from your other frigates and cruisers. While you have some carrier options, you'll mostly want to take advantage of your high-quality anti-fighter ships for protection against more carrier-specialized factions, like the so-called New Republic and Penistar Alignment. It's time for the roster breakdown, and we'll start with Arrow 1. The smallest ship available to the Empire on their light frigate shipyards, the Gamma Assault Transport, are outfitted to attack enemy ships rather than enemy fighters, which is usually people's first instinct with these kinds of small ships. But with their ion cannons, proton torpedoes, and turbo lasers, they can do quite a bit of damage. They're great for attacking targets with heavy weapons who won't be able to effectively counterattack. For dedicated anti-fighter, the Empire does have a 1 and 2 pop cap option, the IPV and the Lancer. When possible, Lancers are usually preferred, but IPVs will allow you to fill open slots both in pop cap and physical coverage on the map, since you can have them in more places. The Lancer in particular has some of the best point defense in the game though, able to take out an enemy bomb every 0.12 seconds. So if you get them in the path of incoming bombers or missile ships, they'll more than earn their place in your fleets. Using anti-fighter corvettes as the Empire also means your fighters, which would otherwise have to be on defense, can be used more aggressively. Speaking of fighters, your best source for them early on will be the Ton Falk carrier. It's got a reasonable pool of HP and shields, but you're basically just bringing these for their fighter and bombers, so keep them closer to the back of your fleets. If you're looking for damage from your corvettes and light frigates, you've got the Karak cruiser and the KDY strike cruiser. Carracks have a great anti-shield damage loadout with their light ions, so if you're fighting Mon Calamari cruisers, they're always a good choice. Their heavy turbo lasers make them well suited to attacking large targets in general though too. The KDY Strike has a more balanced approach, where it can't hit at the same range as the Carrick, so it can be a bit more dangerous to approach enemy capital ships, but its additional lighter weaponry helps it take out smaller targets that the Carrick can't effectively hit. It even comes with some bombers to help take on those capital ships. Both options, along with your corvettes, can be kept safe through the use of healing fleet tenders, specifically the final Imperial Light Frigate, the Star Galleon. If you keep a few KDY strikes or Carricks, usually three or four works best, around a Star Galleon, you can keep them safe for a long time and save yourself from the usual downside of using smaller ships, where they have to be replaced more often than a capital ship. In general, people tend to sleep on their corvette options, so really don't do that. Give them a shot and you won't regret it. They can be slightly harder to use, but their output when properly managed can also be much higher than the same credit or population cap worth of capital ships. The Empire's heavy frigates are more direct ship-to-ship -ship combat focused. Often what I'll do is use the capital ships as the Empire to soften a target, while letting the frigates finish them off, and moving the capitals on to the next big target. However, that can vary from ship to ship. The Dreadnought, Precursor, and Acclimator 2 are especially good for this, since their loadouts are entirely turbo laser or physical munition focused. 
meaning they waste no damage when attacking hulls like ion cannon users do, though their power to weapons abilities can also help strip shields equally as well as they help power through the last few hardpoints on a target. The Acclimator 2 in particular has some of the highest DPS output per population point in the game, while the Precursor skews a lot more heavily towards defenses, including some short-range laser cannons to help against incoming fighters and bombers. The Victory Star Destroyer Mark 1 and 2 are generally better at the upfront attack on a ship, and can handle any targets that need attention while your full-size ISDs are busy. The Victory 1 has a ton of concussion missiles, so while it should avoid point defense heavy areas, it can do a lot of burst damage, and since those missiles lock on, that makes it good against other small, non-point defense equipped targets that could otherwise be hard to hit with turbo lasers. When an enemy has heavily clustered hardpoints, the splash damage from the missiles can take several out at once, too. On the Victory 2, you have the only ion cannon access in the heavy frigate range, with 8 of its 12 hardpoints also being in the heavy tier, meaning they're able to effectively attack larger targets at a longer range, though struggling against other small ships. The final heavy frigate is the Immobilizer 418, which is primarily an interdictor, but it does have a few fighters and lasers for self-defense, and like most other interdictors, its missile interference ability can make it a very helpful support when point defense isn't available in an area, or when there's just too many bombs coming in. At the capital shipyard, you start with three Star Destroyer variants, the Imperial 1 and 2, and the Tector. The Imperial 1 has lower proportional damage overall, but has a higher amount of ion cannons, so it works really well with the strategy of having your capital soften the target while the frigates clean it up. The ISD-2's additional turbo laser damage means it can handle the cleanup on its own, though its lack of the ion cannons the ISD-1 has can often mean it's less attractive against fleets of Mon Calamari cruisers and other similarly heavily shielded targets. Both are also technically carriers, so no matter what you're building a fleet around, you're going to want the ISD-1 or 2 to be a centerpiece of it. If fighters aren't your thing, the Tector gives those up for a bit more damage and defense over the ISD-1 in particular, mostly concentrated in twice as many medium turbo lasers as the other two Star Destroyer variants have. If none of those are big enough for you, you can also choose to build your fleet around a Super Star Destroyer, supported by other capitals or frigates. For most eras, this is the classic Executor class. It has a pretty good array of weapons and fighters, making it similar to an ISD in that it's a jack of all trades and less specialized than other SSD types. Just watch out for any A-wings flying at your bridge and it'll be fine. Like all super ships though, any damage done to them will stick between battles and will repair automatically at 10% of the total hull strength for 5% of the ship's cost per galactic week. Be careful not to send a damaged SSD against a full enemy fleet, but you can also take advantage of this to whittle down the enemy SSDs. If you want to check the status of your Super Star Destroyers, there's a list of them and how damaged they are from the Galactic Stats log on the left side of the screen. Your armies as the Empire will tend to have more focus on heavy vehicles and speedy repulsor tank support. Though Stormtroopers make a versatile infantry corps, and the lower tier army troopers come in enough numbers to help in map control with a variety of weapons available to them as well. Scout bikes are also especially good for not just scouting and regular infantry handling, but any impromptu Order 66-ing when you see one of Luke's pesky New Jedi Order members or an enemy Dark Jedi. The ATPT and ATST are also both good anti-infantry options, with the ATPT's self-repair and point defense making it deceptively durable against infantry in particular, though they will pretty much crumple when they look at an enemy vehicle. If you're fighting in infantry-only terrain, though, the ATPD can go there and be perfectly safe from those bigger bullies. The final light vehicle for the Empire is the Chariot LAV, a command vehicle able to lay mines, transport infantry, and deal some anti-vehicle damage. Their speed and ability to traverse water while carrying infantry can make them pretty useful depending on the map you're playing on. On the heavy vehicle factory, the Empire has the ATAA, a walker designed to take out aerial vehicles, but which can also handle other light tanks as well, and it took me three times to say aerial properly. The faction's artillery is the SPMAG, a slow walker with a huge range that especially poses a danger to faraway infantry engagements and structures, though it is very vulnerable if caught by any enemy force. The last three of the heavy vehicles are your primary complementary forces, for either your main infantry or tank forces, since their speed and ability to traverse tough terrain makes them great for either raiding the enemy base or softening other enemy targets before a full engagement. 
In the air, these are the Deathhawk Speeder, a black anti-vehicle speeder which is definitely not just mostly the Rebel Snow Speeder from Hoth, as well as the IDT, which is kind of like an Imperial Lat, able to transport infantry around the map very quickly, on top of having its own mix of solid anti-vehicle and anti-infantry weaponry. For the Repulsor Tank, they have the S1 Firehawk, which is equipped with a super heavy anti-vehicle blaster, allowing it to attack at extreme range, though it does also have an extra anti-infantry blaster to help against infantry. The most powerful Imperial vehicles come from the Advanced Vehicle Factory. These are the PX-4 Mobile Command Base, which has a useful ping ability to scout for bombing runs and bombardments, along with the ability to transport infantry and even some light vehicles, though not quite as quickly as the IDT can and only over land. For your standard slow frontal advances, the AT-AT is the classic Imperial go-to. They're vulnerable when flanked, but if they can manage to set up a head-on engagement, very little can stand up to their firepower. They can even drop an extra squad of stormtroopers if things get rough, and their height makes it difficult for enemies to hide from them behind terrain. If you want to cheese it up with extra cheese, the stormtrooper deployment also lets their turreted head rotate a full 360 degrees, so if you're getting attacked from behind and the ability is available, it can sometimes save a beleaguered walker. Just keep in mind whenever you do that you're making the game sad. To sacrifice some of that raw power for less vulnerability and a bit more mobility, the Empire also has the A5 Juggernaut. It's a bit weaker in damage and health, but sometimes you just want to get in and out fast, and that's what the A5 is good for. Next we'll go through each era's changes to the space and ground rosters. The change from Sate Pestage to Isard isn't a huge roster shift, though losing Pestage's economic bonus isn't ideal early. Isard does have an SSD as her flagship though, so you're basically trading the economic bonus for a massive pizza slice. Roster-wise, it just swaps the KDY strike for the regular Lorinar strike cruiser. The roles they fill are similar, but the biggest difference is the lack of bombers on the Lorinar. Before you move to Era 3, Thrawn, you should build the regular executor as well, since Thrawn doesn't have access to it. He also trades out the Tector. In exchange, he gets the Allegiance Battlecruiser, a tanky battlecruiser fulfilling a similar role to the Tector. Despite its size, its mix of light, medium, and heavy weaponry means it's not as easily threatened by small ships as many other battlecruisers are. Thrawn also gets the Interdictor Star Destroyer, which is a step up over the Immobilizer 418, which he also still keeps. It's better at direct combat without the same vulnerability to bombers that other capital ships have, thanks to its missile interference ability. Thrawn gets another versatile ship in the Vindicator Heavy Cruiser, which fits into the KDY Strike mold as well, though with some added anti-fighter damage on top of its own fighters and bombers. Finally, at the Light Frigate level, Thrawn is the only Imperial leader to have boarding shuttles, which allow you to capture damaged enemy ships. Ships will say in their description whether they can be boarded, so all you have to do is lower their health, the lower the better, you're basically playing Pokemon without the status effects, drop in your boarding shuttle, use the ability, and hope for the best. Thrawn even gets a fancy new bomber type, the Scimitar Assault Bomber. Each era changes most loadouts a little bit, but we won't be talking too much about specific fighter types in this guide. Thrawn's big benefit is his personal command bonus, giving a massive buff to other ships in his fleet, despite his lack of super ship access. In the Dark Jedi Joris Sabaoth, the first Dark Jedi hero you'll have access to outside of getting lucky with legitimacy, can make a big difference in your ground battles too. Thrawn is the first era with a change to ground rosters, where he gets a unique Stormtrooper company equipped with force blocking his Alamari, buildable on the planet Merkir and nowhere else. This is also the final era where the unique and powerful Nogri assassins are available to the Empire on the planet Honiger, so if you want to use either of those, make sure you start building them now. After Thrawn, you get Palpatine and the Dark Empire, arguably the peak of the Empire's strength because of all the new toys and the ridiculous power of the Emperor himself, who has access to the absurdly broken Force Corrupt ability, which can basically win the entire ground battle for you, and we'll be getting some adjustments in the future. Palpatine loses access to the boarding craft, but gains the modular Task Force Cruiser Sensor and Support variants. The Sensor gives some fighter buffs, while the Support is a healing fleet tender of a higher class than the Star Galleon. Both are actually alright in combat on their own, particularly the sensor variant which has much stronger shields and more diverse weaponry, but they are mostly there as utility ships. A new battlecruiser also joins the roster, the Praetor II, which is completely covered in heavy weaponry for taking on capital ships, 
compared to the mixed weaponry of the Allegiance. Palpatine does lose access to the Interdictor Star Destroyer, but he gains two Star Dreadnoughts, both of which have their own interdiction, the Eclipse and the Sovereign. Both excel at single target damage via their super lasers, making them fantastic for dueling other super ships, battle cruisers, or just attacking planets with high level stations or shipyards. Now, some computers don't actually cooperate very well with the ability, and depending on hardware setup, you may experience a crash when using it or selecting the ships, which isn't ideal, but unfortunately we haven't found an alternative yet since it's a core game engine issue. For a lot of people though, it is absolutely fine. So maybe just make sure you're saving regularly. Ground also comes with some new toys in Palpatine's Dark Empire. The ATST and ATAT get new upgraded versions for the rest of the game. The ATSTA, which has more health and damage, and the Turbo Laser ATAT, which has a much longer range and splash damage on its main cannons. These are incredibly powerful right now and are actually getting a bit of a nerf in point three, so take advantage of them while you can. The A5 Juggernaut also gets replaced with the XR85 tank droid a giant treaded vehicle with a primary cannon able to do massive damage to a single target, though it's not quite as fast as the A5, along with a mix of other anti-vehicle and anti-infantry weaponry. Barracks on the capital world of Biss also get two unique infantry types, the Dark Jedi, which aren't the most useful until they get reworks right now, and very powerful Dark Stormtroopers, toting repeaters and turbo cannons, along with the ability to self-heal. They also have cool black armor, so why wouldn't you use them? The next era, Karnor Jax, has a plethora of funny looking new heroes and some valuable economic benefits, along with Karnor himself being a pretty great ground hero, though not as good as Palpatine. It largely represents a fall from grace for the faction though, so no new units become available, and the modular task force variants, the Eclipse, the Sovereign, and the unique Biss infantry lock. You may end up feeling inclined to move to Dala right away, but you do get some strong economic benefits from your heroes, a good assortment of strong ground heroes, and this is the last era where you can build allegiances, so you want to think about it before you move on. When you do decide to move to Dala though, she swaps the IPV as your one pop anti-fighter for the Mandalorian Crusader, which is an upgrade in most respects, though the price does reflect that. You can also gain the Imperial Patrol Nebulon B, which is another point defense option with a lot of flexibility in small ship combat, including the Power to Shields ability giving it some helpful added durability. If you've been missing the Executor, it makes its return to the roster for the first time since Isard along with the Tector, in exchange for the Allegiance. On ground, Dala does get a Clone Wars classic as well, the Dwarf Spider Droid, a fantastic little anti-vehicle option joining your infantry. Honestly, to me, they're one of the main draws for playing an Eris 6 start as the Empire, which I'm kind of thinking of doing now. After Dala, you have the final Imperial leader, Gilad Pelion, though his only change is the return of the Interdictor Star Destroyer. Beyond the regimes, the Empire has a secondary government mechanic called Legitimacy, which interacts with every other Imperial Warlord faction, the Penistar Alignment, Greater Maldrood, Warlord Zinj, and Ariado Authority. As each faction takes or loses planets or loses their heroes, they will gain or lose legitimacy. With every increase in legitimacy, there's a chance to convince a smaller Imperial group to join your faction. There are five tiers of increasingly strong groups, with the final tier being one of the five potential Super Star Destroyer heroes. If you unlock a group, they'll send you a message and you'll be able to recruit them from the political options menu. Some planets listed in the government overview section give additional legitimacy for capturing them, like Coruscant, Kuat, and Karita, which raises your chance of gaining a group. All of the different groups are also listed on this screen, so if you want to see what the possibilities are, you can check there. Once you've unlocked a group from each tier, you can keep unlocking groups from the first four tiers. If an Imperial faction has lost all of their leaders, also listed in the government overview and has no Super Star Destroyers, once they're knocked down to three or fewer planets, that faction will surrender, in the following galactic week, they will join the most legitimate Imperial faction, bringing all of their surviving units, planets, and heroes with them, so you have a reason to make sure that the other Imperials are kept down a little bit, don't just try to unite with them and take on the Rebels or something. While the faction leader and Super Star Destroyers do need to be dead to join, the check for whether they will join is only on losing a planet so killing a leader when they have three planets left won't make a faction join. But once you kill the leader, taking the next planet if it is within that range would make the check happen. Sometimes you want to target another Imperial faction to make sure they don't grab heroes or factions that you want, 
but other times you may want to leave them alone on the chance that you could inherit something that they have. If you're just starting out with the mod, the Thrawn campaign may be a good galactic conquest choice to figure out the ropes, but for some tips to start off we'll be focusing on the medium known galaxy map. The Empire starts mostly surrounded, but they also have a good chunk of starting forces, rich planets, and strong defenses. Enemies near the core also tend to be a bit scattered or separated, so it can be harder for them to make a united attack early on. First, you'll notice some independent worlds to the west. These are the Uvitha and they're locked until Era 7, where they can start attacking with a large fleet, but you have plenty of time to prepare so don't worry about them just yet. You'll want to pick one primary direction to expand, either east, north, or south, and work towards building defenses to the other two directions. This basically means picking another Imperial who you want to integrate. If you go north and go especially quickly, you might even be able to knock out the Penistar alignment before their leader, Artis Kane, shows up in his Super Star Destroyer Reaper. If you go east, you may be able to take out the Greater Maldrude and grab Hut Space, uniting your separated forces from Kessel, Honiger, and eventually the Maw, which you might otherwise have to sacrifice. By going south, you could both integrate Ariadu and prevent the New Republic from unifying a lot of their forces. Any of these approaches are viable, but the main thing is making sure you keep up with developing your core planets with defenses and keep a fleet nearby to respond to attacks. Hopefully those tips will give you the push you need to restore the Emperor's new order to its former glory. There will be some other guides for the Imperial Warlord factions coming soon, so subscribe here if you want to see those as they come. Best of luck on the battlefield, Commander.